Let's open our Bibles this morning to Jeremiah chapter 17. We're continuing the series of messages called Pivot, Turning to God in the New Normal. And we're going to look at a chapter from Jeremiah for the next few minutes. We're glad that you're here this morning. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say this. Happy Father's Day. Those of you who are dads, this is your day. It's your special day. Uh, and thank you for being here to worship you make a huge difference, not in the, only the life of your family, but in the life of our church and in the life of our society. You mentor, you guide, uh, you lovingly bring along and correct uh, young men and young women and help to grow them. And so we salute fathers. We believe that dads are essential uh, in our families and dads are essential in our world. So happy Father's Day to you and welcome all of you who are right now joining us uh, that will worship with us online or by television. So thank you also for being here today. Speaking of television, Alex Trebek has been a fixture on afternoon television for over 30 years as the host of Jeopardy. Uh, he is suffering from cancer right now and is in treatment for that. And so you could certainly pray for him, especially if you're a big fan of the show. But one of the things that got my attention was that a few years ago, 2012 actually, Alex Trebek was moving some furniture in his home. And when the move of the furniture was over, he was really sore, like his, his, his pectoral muscle was just really sore. And he thought, you know what? I might've strained a muscle moving all this furniture around. Well, he went along for several days and it didn't get a lot better. And so he decided to go see a doctor and they said, yeah, you, you could have strained a muscle. Let's do some physical therapy. So they started physical therapy and they began to, uh, to try to work the muscle and it didn't get better. As a matter of fact, it got worse. And so after a few uh, sessions of physical therapy, they said, well, maybe that's not what it is. So let's send you to another doctor. And they sent him to a doctor. The doctor ran an EKG. And when he came, when the doctor came back into the examining room, uh, Alex Trebek said, can you tell me what's wrong with me? And the doctor in true Jeopardy fashion said, what is arterial blockage? You see, what was happening was that uh, he did not have a pulled muscle. He had a blocked artery. And while it seemed that what he had was muscular, the truth is that what he had was cardiovascular. And if not careful, if not treated, he would absolutely be dead. It was absolutely deadly. Now, here's the reality. Sometimes the problem you think you have is not the problem you have. Sometimes the problem you think you have is, the, is a symptom of a larger problem, a deeper problem, one that you need to get to the bottom of. And that isn't just true physically. It is absolutely true spiritually. When it comes to our walk in this life, a lot of times we think what I have are some problems that I just need a solution to. I need a band-aid for these things. Let me give you an example. Some of us would say, you know what? I have some bad habits. I got some bad habits. You know, I, I, I have this bad habit that when I'm put in a kind of a pressure pack situation, I, I kind of leave out details. I, I, it's not that I don't tell the truth. It's that I don't tell the whole truth. And I make myself look a little bit better in doing so. I just got a bad habit. No, it's a lie. It's what that is. Or maybe what you do is you go on social media and you make sure you put a post on social media that portrays people who think differently than you think or they believe differently than you believe and you portray them in the worst possible light. That's just a bad habit. No, it's slander. Is what that is. Or maybe it's not a habit. Maybe it, it's some other action. You know, uh, maybe, maybe I drink a little too much. I, 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 I drink a little too much. It's not all the time. I just, maybe I drink a little too much. Or maybe it's an attitude. You know, I got a bad temper. Don't set me off. I got a bad temper. After all, my dad had a bad temper. I got it from him. My granddad had a bad temper. Bad tempers just run in my family. That's my excuse. And so sometimes we have habits and actions and attitudes that in all reality, we say are just bad attitudes, habits, and actions. But the truth is they are symptoms of something much, much deeper. And that's what the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah is going to speak to us about today. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah 
is living in a time when Israel or Judah, the nation that he's living in, is in a period of tremendous change. Let me give you a little backtracking to tell you the story behind all of this. And it's kind of been a couple of weeks since we've worked on this material after remix last week. So let me give you the background. Judah, the southern kingdom, had a horribly wicked king. His name was Manasseh. Manasseh was the worst king in the history of the nation of Judah. He was an idolater. He introduced idolatry into their national life. In Solomon's temple, the temple built dedicated to the worship of the true God of Israel, Manasseh erected idolatrous statues. He put those, those idols in the very temple to the God who said, you shall not make a graven image and you will not worship any graven image. And right there in the temple, he puts these, these idols. Manasseh also neglected the moral law of God. He allowed murder. He allowed uh, bribery. He, he allowed for the rich to oppress the poor. And because of that, society was just crumbling. But he remained on the throne. For 55 years, this wicked man who just multiplied wickedness, who came up with, who just tried to invent a new way every day to sin against God, remained on the throne. But eventually, thankfully, he died. And his son became king. His son's name was Ammon. Well, for two years, Ammon reigned as king. Only two years. Only two years because really people wanted something to change. And they realized under Ammon, nothing was going to change. And his own advisors killed him in his palace. And they installed as king his young son, Josiah. When Josiah was 16 years old, he decided what he wanted to do was change some things. And he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start by taking the temple that Solomon built. It was the centerpiece of Jerusalem. He said, we're going to restore that. Let's take some government money and, and remodel it and make sure we fix it up. And it's kind of in disrepair. It's been neglected. So they start remodeling the temple. They start restoring the temple. And the Bible says they found a dusty old book. Now that dusty old book was a copy of Deuteronomy. It had not been read in 60 years or so. And so they unrolled this, this scroll, this book, and they began to read it. And it was the book of Deuteronomy. They read this book and they say, you know what? The king, our young king wants to change things and he needs to read this book. Our king has never heard any of this before. His father and his grandfather would not have told him these things. And so they take the book to Josiah, the king, and they unroll the scroll and they read this book to him. And it tells of how they are not to have idols. And it tells of how the sacrifices are to be offered. It tells about the religious life of Israel. But then it also contains things like the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy does. It's the second giving of the law. And so it's the moral law. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. And the Bible says that Josiah tore his robes. It was an outward sign of repentance. Just like baptism is an outward sign of faith in Christ. In the Old Testament, someone who tore their robes, it was an outward sign of anguish and repentance. He knew he had offended God. His people had offended God. He got on his knees and he asked God to forgive him. And then he set about in a series of reforms. He destroyed all those idolatrous statues that his grandfather had built. He ripped all of those out of the temple of the one true God. He went throughout the land tearing down these idolatrous uh, monuments to Asherah and Baal and all these uh, worship sites to false gods. He began to restore the religious life of Israel. They offered sacrifices again. They hadn't even celebrated Passover in decades. Now that's like modern day Christians saying, we're just going to forget Easter for about 30 years. I mean, think about that. The most, one of the most important days in Israel's history. So he reinstitutes Passover and the celebration of being rescued out of their slavery in Egypt and being brought out. And he also reformed the laws because when you're a king, 
You can just change the laws like that. You don't have to have Congress or Parliament. And he said murder is illegal and bribery is illegal. And, and we're going to have courts that treat people equally regardless of you're rich or you're poor. And so he, he reinstitutes moral change in the land. And if you looked at it from the outside, you would say, man, things are going great. But Jeremiah, this prophet, this prophet who sees beyond the surface, God gives him the ability to see that it is not just reform that is needed. It is not reformation. It is transformation that is needed. And so Jeremiah stands up and he speaks. I want you to listen to what he says from Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. And makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert, and will not see prosperity when prosperity comes, but will live in stony waste in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose trust is the Lord, for he will be like a tree. Planted by the water that extends its roots by the stream and will not fear when the heat comes. But its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. I want you to listen to verse 9. This is the the core of what Jeremiah is trying to communicate. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the result of his deeds. As a partridge that hatches eggs which it has not laid, so is he who makes a fortune but unjustly. In the midst of his days it will forsake him, and in the end he will be a fool. A glorious throne on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away on earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living water, even the Lord. Verse 14, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved for you are my praise. Here's what Jeremiah is trying to communicate to some ancient people 2,600 years ago. And his message flows through centuries of time to us today because these words are inspired by the Spirit of God. And the message that Jeremiah wants us to understand is that you can change a lot of things outwardly. You can make your life look a lot better. You can become more religious. You can become more moral. But if there is not deep inward change, nothing has really changed. If I could give you a single sentence this morning that summarizes what I believe Jeremiah is saying to us, it is simply this. The heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. That's what Jeremiah is saying to us. The heart of our problem is a problem of our heart. Jeremiah uses that word over and over in this passage. What what does he mean by heart? Well, when Jeremiah refers to heart, he's not talking about that two-pound muscular pump in your chest that is essential for you to have physical life. That's not what he's referring to. In Jewish literature, when someone talked about the heart, they were talking about the seat of your personality. Everything that makes you uniquely you about you, your inner life, not your, not uh, your physical body, but everything else about you is your heart. It's your emotions. And if you think about it, we still associate the heart with emotions. I mean, uh, there are songs repeatedly you drive home today, turn on the radio and there'll be a song about the heart on the radio. And it's about our emotions. It's about the emotion of love. But for a Jewish person, this, the heart wasn't just about your emotions. It was about your mind your memories, your experiences, your will, your personality. It was about everything that made you, you. And so when he says heart, he's talking about your inner life, 
the life within you, what makes you a unique person. And he says that there's a problem with this heart. As a matter of fact, he points out three real problems with the heart. He says, first of all, the heart is desperately needy. The heart is desperately needy. The heart desires the approval of people around us. Look at verse 5. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Our hearts are so desperate for approval and for acceptance. And what he says here in verse 5 is that we trust in mankind. We put our, our value, we allow the, what people think of us to assign a value to us. And when we do that, we begin to trust in what man says about us and not what God says about us. Social media is a great magnifier of this. I mean, you post something on social media and you immediately go back a couple of hours later or, or a day later and, and you want to know how many likes I got. How many people approved of my message? How many people retweeted or how many people hit like or how many people commented and said, oh, amen. That's, that's exactly right. Absolutely. You're right on track with that. We crave this, this approval from people and the heart in our fallen state, the natural man so desires for people to accept us and to approve us. And so what we will do is, Jeremiah says, we will turn away from the Lord and his truth. And we'll turn to lies. We will propose lies rather than truth because truth is not acceptable in our culture. But there are lies that are. And so we, we see that the heart is desperately needy. Secondly, the heart is deceitful. Look at verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else. That word deceitful is a really interesting word. It's the word Jacob. The, in English, it would be Jacob. It's actually the name Jacob. And the name Jacob, I'm sorry if your name Jacob, sorry to tell you this, but the name Jacob means deceiver. The word means deceit. Now, the first Jacob is the problem with that, not you, okay? Uh, let, me just, let me, I'm not pointing fingers. But the first Jacob in the Bible got that name because that's exactly what he was. He was the second born of twin boys. His big brother Esau was born first. Now, understand in that culture, if you were born first, if you were a firstborn, you got lots more rights and privileges, you got a bigger inheritance, and you got the blessing. Being a firstborn was a good thing. I, I'm a firstborn, so I propose we all go back to that. But those of you who are not firstborns, you're like, I'm not sure I like this, okay? But that is what happened. But here's what Jacob did. Jacob wanted the blessing. Jacob wanted the bigger inheritance. And so with his mother's help, that's a whole other story, with his mother's help, he goes in to his nearly blind father, disguises himself as his brother Esau, tells his dad he is Esau, and his father gives him the blessing. He's a deceiver. And that's exactly what your heart is. Our heart will deceive us. Our heart will convince us we are so much better than we really are. And the heart does that by comparison. The heart always does that. The heart will say, well, at least you're not like those people. At least you're not like the other person over there. The heart loves comparison. And we have this remarkable capacity for self-deception. We really do. We can absolutely convince ourselves that we're not as bad as we really are. That's what the heart does. The heart is constantly telling us, well, you've got a reason for the way you're that way. You've got a reason for the, the way you were raised this way. You have experiences that cause you to be this way. You got a family that caused you to be this way. Now, those people, they got no excuses. They deserve to be judged and condemned. They're doing the same thing you are, but you've got excuses. That's exactly what the heart does. The heart is constantly in the mode of deceiving us. The heart is desperately needed. 
needy. The heart is deceptive. By the way, the worst advice you could ever give or receive in this life is this. Just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. That is awful advice. It is terrible. Because a desperately needy, deceptive heart will lead you to destruction. And then he sort of slides in one more point about the heart in the very next line in in verse 9. I think we give a lot of attention to the fact that the heart is deceitful above all else. But then he says this. That the heart is desperately sick. The heart is diseased. Now, again, he's not talking about this muscular pump inside your chest. He's talking about the core of who you are. Paul would refer to this in the New Testament as the old man. As the fleshly man. That's what he's talking about. You see, our hearts are diseased beyond curability. They cannot be cured. You cannot do enough, you cannot be religious enough, you cannot be moral enough to cure the heart. You could be like Josiah. And by the way, I am convinced that Josiah, the king, really repented. And he could change a lot of things. He could reinstitute genuine worship. He could reinstitute holidays like the Passover. He could pass laws and say, this is what God expects of us. So here's going to be our moral code. And he could impose that on his nation. But one thing a king cannot do is change someone's heart. He can't do it. And you can pass every law you want to pass. You can change every cultural norm you want to change. You can believe that those outward changes genuinely will bring change. And the truth is, they never do. They are outward. They are external. They are, su- they are superficial. Because what is needed is something else. And that's what Jeremiah tells us about. He tells us. That the hope for our hearts is radical transformation. It's radical transformation. Now, Jeremiah isn't the only person who ever brought this up, by the way. Jesus was talking about this one day. And he was talking to some guys and they said, Jesus, your disciples don't wash their hands right before they eat. So they're defiled. They're sinners. But Jesus said, look. You guys think that it's, and by the way, it wasn't like COVID-19 hand washing for sanitary reasons. They had this, this whole ceremony about how they wash their hands. And Jesus said, guys, all this outward exterior religious stuff, all this legalism about how you wash your hands. Jesus said this, it's not what you take in your body that defiles you. It's what comes out of you. And then Jesus said this, listen to what Jesus said. In Mark chapter 7, verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things proceed from within, and that's what defiles a man. It's not what you take in. It's not the external. It's what is developed in the interior life of the heart. Jesus said every sin is rooted in a desperately needy, deceitful, diseased heart. So what is the answer? Let me propose to you the answer. Heart transplant. That's the answer. The answer is heart transplant. Uh, Not getting your old diseased heart in a little better shape. The old man is never going to be any better. He's not. You can dress him up. You can fix him up. You can can dress him up in religion. He's still not going to be any better. Because he's still the old man. What we need is a new heart. Listen to what David cried out on one occasion. David had sinned the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. And then to cover it over, he had her husband executed. This is God's anointed king of Israel. And he's doing all these horrible things. Then he lied about it for a year. But when David was finally confronted by a faithful friend, he repented and he cried out to God. And what he cried out to God was this. 
create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Another prophet who was sort of a a contemporary with Jeremiah about the same time even wrote these words, Ezekiel 36 verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart. I'll remove your hard heartedness and I'll give you a soft heart, a heart after God. Now think about that. That's 2,600 years ago. They could have never dreamed that on December 3rd, 1967, Dr. Christian Barnard, a South African surgeon, would perform the first ever successful human-to-human heart transplant. A 53-year-old grocer with diabetes and heart failure was dying. And Barnard had studied the, the possibility of transplants. He had even practiced it on animals in research. And that man was dying, and so this 27-year-old young lady was involved in a horrible accident. She was brain dead, but her heart was still pumping. And her family gave Barnard the, the permission to attempt this transplant. And he took her heart, her healthy heart, and he transplanted it into the, into the chest of this man who had this diseased heart. Now, that man only lived 19 days. But it was successful. And it gave doctors all over the world hope that this could actually work. His second patient lived 19 months. But God says, if you'll let me do a spiritual heart transplant on you, you can live forever. If you will let me extract that heart of stone, that cold, callous heart, if you will allow me to transplant my heart into your life, then you can truly be changed. And here's here's what's wonderful. If you try changing all the exterior stuff, if you try changing all of the outward stuff, it'll never work its way in. But if you experience the change that Jesus brings on the inside, it always works its way out to your actions and your attitude. See, I think we're treating the wrong thing sometimes. We're treating habits and we're treating actions and we're treating attitudes when what needs to be treated is the heart. I believe this says something to our culture today, by the way. I really do. And I think we need to hear this. I really wondered, God, why in the world are you having me preach this book of Jeremiah? It's hard. It's complicated. I'm like, couldn't I have done something easy in the summer? You know, wouldn't it have been nice? But I really do believe this says something to us. I really believe that the problem in our nation, I want you to hear me, is deeper than what is outward. I believe we have a deep spiritual problem in our nation. And I believe the only solution to our problem is a spiritual solution. It's not just changing exterior things, whatever those exterior things may be. It is that people need a change of heart. Racism has outward actions, but racism is rooted in the heart of people. To think that to look down on someone because of the color of their skin or the language that they speak because of any ethnicity is is a form of hatred. And it's rooted in our hearts. We need a heart change. Some of us look around us and we see our world in, in what looks like chaos at times. And we grow very fearful. And we grow very angry. And there is an expression of anger sometimes that is righteous. I will, I will certainly admit that. I think the Bible teaches that. But there, is also, there are also expressions of anger that are unrighteous and wrong and sinful. And those are rooted in our hearts. They are rooted deeply in our hearts. And unless our hearts are genuinely changed, then everything else will just be superficial. And the underlying cause will not be addressed. And I've been thinking about this for myself an awful lot. You see, in America, there is a new religion. 
It really is. I don't know if you know this or not, but it's a new religion. And the new religion is that you must conform. And you must conform perfectly to what the culture says is tolerated. The only virtue of this new religion is tolerance. And the only thing that will not be tolerated is biblical truth. And if you step out of line, then you are worthy to be shunned and maybe even persecuted because you do not conform to the new religion. And if you fail this new religion at any point, there is no path to redemption. None. Let me say this to you. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is far from it. Jeremiah, in his prophecies, looked forward to a day. And this is what he says in Jeremiah chapter 31. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart. I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man to his neighbor and each man to his brother saying, know the Lord. For they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. Look at this last expression. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. God says, I will hit delete on every file that contains your sinful actions and your sinful attitudes and I will remember them against you no more. How could God do that? Does he just sweep them under the rug? No. Because they are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus that forgives our sins. It is the blood of Jesus That has the power to change us. And it is resurrection power that brought a man out of a grave. That can create a clean heart in every single one of us. And that is what our country desperately needs. But before a country needs it. I need it. You need it. And if you've never trusted Christ. This is your day. Don't leave here without it. Give him your life. Confess to him the reality. That you need change. I've prayed this prayer this week. Lord, my country needs change. So let it begin with me. Search me. Search me. That's what the psalmist cried out. Search me. And see if there is any wicked way in me. Start afresh with me. But Lord, before our country can change, I need to. I want to ask you to bow your heads together. All over this room, with your head bowed. This is really a a message for us each individually to take seriously. We do have this remarkable ability to deceive ourselves. To think of ourselves as much better than we are. And we need to humbly come before God and cry out to him and say, search me. Oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Maybe where you're sitting right now, you just need to say, God, search me. Maybe there are some sinful habits or attitudes that I've stuffed away in the closet of my heart and I've never confessed them to you as sin. And I ask you right now, To open that, reveal it to me. But God doesn't reveal it to you for your humiliation. God reveals it to you so that he can cleanse it. Some of us need to do that today. Some of you need to trust Jesus and ask him to give you that new heart. A clean heart. Because life really is not going to change much because of religion. Life's really not going to change much because you make a resolution. Life's going to change because you experience redemption. And Jesus offers it to you today. And if you would just say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've broken your commandments. I've done things that are wrong. 
I've allowed my heart to deceive me into thinking I'm better than I am. But I come before you today saying that nothing that I am and nothing that I have is worthy of you. But I believe that by your grace, you love me. You died for me. You were risen from the dead so that I could have life forever with you. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life. Father, I pray for those who pray a prayer like that, that right now, today, they would experience your Spirit's work for new life. God, do a work among us. Do a work within us in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.